and just go? Sorry. Yeah, okay. Um, so we did a little reshuffle because this is going to be a decidedly underwhelming update. Um, but uh, we had a really good conversation a couple of days ago about this idea of some sort of like an open source of <clears throat> an open repository of materials uh, that cover a lot of the topics that we've been talking about here. So there wasn't really much movement on the development side. Uh, it was more about just sort of having a conversation as a group and, and seeing if there was some shared interest and seeing sort of what was the path forward. Um, and the result of this right now looks like it's going to be inside of this GitHub uh, organization called Neural Data Science. We're going to start uh, populating that with a collection of Jupyter notebooks, a collection of Git repositories, each of which will cover some sort of uh, a different module in this kind of general space of data analytics, data processing, data pipelines, um, workflows, stuff like that. Um, an example of this is the NeuroML uh, uh, Git repository that uh, Satra put together. Um, this is like some machine learning topics. It's a little bit like the nylon tutorial that I gave. Um, and so what we want to do is start to sort of polish these and actually like organize them a little bit so that they fit into some sort of coherent structure. If you're interested in getting involved in any of that, um, the main repository that we're going to use to sort of have discussions about this at a high level is this one right here, which is neurodata science slash neurodata science. Um, and there we have like a to-do list, which was basically born out of a whiteboarding session that we put together um, in our meeting. And if you have any thoughts or interests or questions about this, then feel free to chime in there. I'll post a link in the, uh, the Slack room, and hopefully we'll uh, I think that's about it. Okay, cool. Next up. And one of the things we would really like is if you guys hold workshops or other things to A, reuse these materials if you can and contribute new materials so that you generate a piece of data. Sampling it a lot, and then 
matrix is only as big as your number of subjects, which is presumably less than a thousand, you might actually like you gain speed or you gain you gain money, right? Because you don't, you're using less memory. And all those things don't happen on regular grids. Because on a regular grid, you pay for having a node which has fixed amount of memory and fixed amount of compute time, which is all the time. So what you're saying is Amazon pays you for one your... Yeah, basically. <laughs> Except for the fact that when I do this, so I'm gonna do a little math here. This is the price per 100 milliseconds for some reason. So this is price per second times price per hour, so it's 10 cents an hour almost, 9 cents an hour, times 7 days a week, uh, <coughs> sorry, times 24 days, 24 hours a day, times 7 days a week, times the 700 nodes that we have at home, I guess, that's $10,000. Yeah. So don't use this for heavy compute. Um, I was super excited about it when I saw those zeros, and a couple days ago I actually computed it out, and so if you run this all the time, it's not worth it. Um, you should just buy your own GPUs or something. But what I do think this is useful for, and what I was trying to work for, was burst decomputation. So the idea that I want to know this model now, and I don't have seven days times 700 nodes times whatever uh, hours of compute. I have a lot of little things that I need to get done really quickly. So that's what. Uh, AWS and Android is good at and what I was exploring. Um, it's not really designed for heavy computation. It's designed for Netflix deciding that they need to send more nodes somewhere else or that they need to encode the next, uh, I don't know, community episode. So you get, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so you only get like a gig and a half of gram. And you get half a gig of ephemeral disk, which disappears as soon as your process is over. And your process can only last six minutes. Okay, so it costs a fraction of a cent and you get a fraction of a cent of computing. But we wanted to go to the cloud so we could do it all at the same time. So one thing that you can do is that you can have 1,024 processes at the same time, which is pretty cool. Um, or at least I thought so. So that's what I did playing in the clouds in Cloud City. Um, right. But to do that, I had to create a lot of software for S3, which is their way of extracting money out of you. Um, S3 is their storage service. Their storage service is not free. And also is a little clumsy to use. They have a Python interface called Photo 3. They also have Photo 2, which is not Photo 3. It does not have the same interface. Um, and what Boto does is it gives you just the API to S3. S3 has a lot of buckets, and there's a strange file system there, and it has unique keys and all sorts of things that you can read about if you want to read a novel. Um, but instead of that, I built something that gives you just a workspace. So you have one bucket, and everything is accessible from the root layer, and there's no idea about directories or things like that. But um, I call it you know, Boto Bench. It's, well, I guess you can't see that, but you can look at it on GitHub. I thought it was pretty useful. So it's like the MATLAB workspace or the R workspace you have, except it's on S3, so that's nice. Um, it's on the one that's linked to here, except I haven't pushed the latest version, so I'm sure there were bugs in the current one. Um, right, so it just lets you push and pull from, from S3 quickly. And for those of you worried that you're increasing your costs and you won't be able to pay rent, a lot of the first, like, however many calls are free. You can look it up if you're really worried. I was going to include pricing and all that, but I got distracted by Lambda, so, yeah. Um, to show you that you can do a lot of computing at the same time, I did 5 times 10 to the 4 threads at the same in the last uh, 6 minutes. So that was cool. Um, unfortunately, I also have that many errors. <laughs> because I'm not the greatest sci fi wizard. He's sitting over there. Um, and also because it's hard to debug on Lambda. So before we get into whatever else I have to show you, um, which is pretty much nothing, let me just show you what a pain in the butt this place is. 
Um, so instead of getting the nice Python, like I have an error and you read it from the bottom to the top, you can get that, but first you have to look for your, your correct thread. And since I have five times 10 to the four threads, um, yeah, I have to pick one. And this is just the latest one. Maybe the errors are random, maybe they had some other problems with them. I won't be able to look at all of them. So that's one issue. In this one, it's saying, okay, it started, and it's doing my tracking model. That's something I put in there. And then the buffer has the wrong number of dimensions. What's going on with this? Uh, the, the probabilistic direction getter is doing badly. But at least we're able to get stuff going on. Okay. So that's cool. And you get to know that I use uh, about four seconds of time. That's cool. And half a gig of memory. Yeah. So Isn't that more memory than my life? No, you can scale it. So my max. Oh, sorry, that's my max. Yeah. So at the end, it'll show like the max I really used, the real memory, was 488. So roughly half a gig. And my set max is 640. And you can set it to whatever you want. If you feel really rich, you can set it to like. Um, yeah, so the code is on GitHub. You can look at it. It's really janky because it was designed to do one thing, which is try and do track sampling a lot at the same time. Um, one thing, to, another thing to know about Lambda is that you can only have 50 gigs of compressed code. So after you zip up your code, or 50 gigs, that would be huge, 50 megs of compressed code. And some of you are thinking like, wow, code is basically just text. That's like three or 400 novels, like 50 megs is a lot. It's, it goes really fast. Um, so I'm actually gonna show you that. And well, we're gonna look at it this way. I know it's really ugly, but it's the easiest way to look at things. So this, these are all the packages I used. I used Cloud Pickle, which is a great name, SciPy, NiBabel, uh, a NiBabel extension, I'm assuming, NumPy, and SciPy. And together, these are 49 gigs compressed, or 49 megs compressed. But that's only after I removed most of SciPy. So some of you have used SciPy stats, which is a great little thing. It's not there anymore. I took that. I just created it. Um, there's some other SciPy methods in optimizing for nonlinear functions, like gradient descent. That's not used by him, so it's gone. Yes? I guess you can use the NumPy in your algebra analysis. I mean, like, you can move some of the NumPy stuff as well. Yeah, you could, yeah, I actually did believe. So if you want to look at the full, I'm oh, sorry, we're not uh, If we want to look at the full list of things that were, that were taken out, um, that's somewhere on here. Yeah, I removed all these packages. So, a lot of them. Uh, sorry to whoever likes life classical estimation, but it, it's useless. Very well, not, not for. <laughs> <laughs> it takes, it literally takes like 20 minutes, which is huge <laughs> for this. Anyway, that's all I got for you. Lambda's really cool. You should try and play with it. Unfortunately, like for me, it's, it's not working out yet, but hopefully like we'll have two bumps and then nothing. Hooray! <laughs> <laughs> Any questions about that? Okay. Oh, yeah, so. uh, I'm just trying to get past all the marketing babble on Amazon. Yeah. So, if I get, let me get it straight. So, Lambda's really good for like small jobs that you don't need to like provision a whole server. Yeah. So, when you provision a server, you ask for it for a set amount of time, whether or not you use it, right? Right. Um, so if I provision a GPU, I should use it all the time. It's two bucks an hour, yeah. right? Um, but if I only want to pay for the real compute I'm doing, and I realize that I do real compute not all the time, because I'm really debugging most of the time, uh, maybe Lambda is worth it. you look at that? Yeah, so batch, you can configure it to provision servers automatically and then tear them down. That's pretty involved. And Lambda was fairly involved. I was thinking about batch, but then I was alone in this project, so you know. Okay. 
But I, maybe batches, I think, what, I, what I'm reading is, might be better for like when you need like to scale to like too many resources, rather than run a lot of micro like jobs. Yeah, there's a guy at Berkeley, Eric Jonas, who's kind of a neuroscientist, I guess. But an anyway, he, he created something called Pyren, which is a really involved way of using Lambda to do simple math, to do um, like huge matrix computations. He claims you can get a teraflop, which is like six GPUs, but on CPU. So CPUs are generally faster and better and cooler, um, except they only have one core. Yeah, so 80 teraflops is pretty awesome. Um, on the other hand, I don't, yeah, most of us don't need 80 teraflops all the time. And getting any complex math to there, so getting any, like, you want Blas, you want pack, that's already 20 meg. So, yeah, getting anything crazy up there is harder. Luckily, your Cython packages are, are usually lightweight, especially if you optimize them using uh, some extra compiler options. So if you wrap your own, if you wrap your own C++, you could write complex math and go away with it at the price of your own time. Just one question. Did you consider something like the lambda spinning up the instance? So you don't use the lambda for the computation? Uh, so using lambda to provision? Yeah. Yeah, uh, Netflix does that. And I used to work for a company that did that, but that's even more involved. Okay. Right? Uh, so Batch or CloudFront or whatever they're calling it now will will say like, oh, you're using a lot of nodes. Let's get some more nodes. And then it'll do that automatically. If, if you did your own computation, you'd probably save money by figuring it out yourself and then provisioning. But um, yeah, I'm, I, I can't get the die plan to work, so like, yeah. But yeah, that's a really cool, that, that would be awesome, like, hit, hit the button and it's like, oh, you need this many in it, figure this out. Cool. This was really fun. Things we see. Okay, great. So well, no, no, no spoilers. <clears throat> so uh, I want to give some background to this project. So like a couple of months ago, I was really bored and I decided to play some with some neural nets because it's like the coolest thing in the valley and all that. Uh, so I thought like, what's the biggest like paired set of data we can get? And that API images and corresponding T1 volumes. So I decided to reconstruct T1 images from API images. Um, so that was fun, and that's the output of that. And um, then you can see from that like vague blob, and managed to figure out like the bones, the skull, and all that. It hallucinated a neck, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, even like the skull stress or the defacing and all that. But if you look closely, uh, it, it sort of like got the cortical folding wrong. Um, it very quickly managed to like work on left, right, flip stuff. Um, so you feed it this way, it's thing, thing. Uh, and the more details you give it, you know, the, the more, the better go the cortical folding. So this is the predicted, and this is the true. Yeah. Uh, so this is pretty cool. Uh, then I got really bored, and, uh, and I just like drew this, and like fed it in, and it was just like, and Simon was like, this is so romantic, and like, and I was just like, this is gross. <laughs> All right, so, 
Uh, but the, this week, uh, I wanted to uh, to try to reconstruct untreasured statistical maps just from the peaks. And this is what I was presenting in the beginning. And it's a journey. So we're going to go to the to the channel, and we're going to journey on. I don't know why this is flickering, but oops, and it's gone. Very, very soft. <laughs> This is in focus, but not quite. Um, oh, and Tal promised to sing a song at the end of the presentation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. Oh, I was flickering. Doesn't matter. Um, so, so in the beginning, we started with this, and this was a 2D network. So we just feed slices and. It's loading, and if it slices, and this is the input, you have dots, and this is the uh, output that we want, and this is what we predicted. Uh, so it's pretty good, uh, but then I realized that uh, the way I preprocessed the data removed all of the um, all of the negative uh, of the deactivation. So then I fixed that, uh, and then we had maps that have both activation and deactivation, so the dark spots. Again, not so bad. Um, we did some more tests, and you know they look reasonable. And then we realized that you know this model is not going to ever fit into memory if we go from a single slice to 3D. Uh, so what we had to do then uh, is to basically start ripping pieces out of the model and like removing layers and s skip layers and all that, and see whether it still works. So. Well, this is uh, so it still worked uh, when we downsize everything to 64 by 64 and remove the skip layers and uh, remove a few layers in the out encoder. Still worked. And then I had to move from PNG images to uh, something called TF records, which is like the, the, the dumbest possible way of storing data that <coughs> TensorFlow, for some reason, thought this is like the only way to do things that are not images. Uh, so we did this. Um, and then, like literally today, I started fitting 3D models. Um, so let's let's have a look at that. Oh, and in terms of parameters, we started with uh, 67 million parameters for the, the 2D model, and we we took it down to 1.6 million. Uh, and when we went back to 3D, we went to 6 million. So it's pretty good. Uh, at least I don't know. And I was happy. Um, so this is how it looks like. So this is like the, the first epoch. So we feed 2,000 images through it. Uh, and, and this is 3D. So now I'm showing only one slice of 3D. So sometimes the slices are completely black. So it means that in this slice, there's no information about how the reconstructed slice should look like. So the only thing that uh, the network has is all the other slices, and maybe in some of them there will be like a one like shiny dot, and it's supposed to reconstruct all the slices. So let's start with this, which looks like me doing, um, but give it some time. How much time? So that has been sitting on my lap for like two hours, and and yeah, and then we have this. Uh, and it starts reconstructing things, and it sort of learns priors because this is HCP, so it, it sort of implicitly learned that there are different types of tasks. And if you compare the maps, it sort of has this heavy prior for like, oh, language, like look at these two. Well, language, like it's just this and this, and it's this and this. Um, so it sort of learned those, those heavy priors. Uh, but the, the catch is, this is the, the training set. So. Um, so yeah, there's dropout involved, which should uh, make it robust. But um, but if you put it on the on the test set, you know it's it's a bit worse, uh, but it still does relatively well uh, in terms of this is holdout, never saw this data um, prediction. So so that works well. Um, so in terms of future directions, we just need more data and to feed it to more data, add some noise different levels of smoothing, whatnot, and then we're going to revolutionize meta-analysis, sort of. Um, but uh, I also want to thank uh, my, my fearless companion. Uh, <laughs> this, is, this is how he feels about this project. Fearless, uh, but uh, <laughs> And also this, just, just to make everyone happy. Uh, <laughs> Um, 
questions? Yeah. Can we use this to like draw weird creepy brain stuff? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I haven't tried it, but I mean, potentially you could like when the letter is like trained with an Afrobus data, you could even deploy it on the web where you would like go and like have this like blank 3D volume and you would like click in a couple of points and it would just reconstruct the whole map for you. And it's just like, yeah, there you go. So you don't have to actually collect any data anymore. Great. Uh, <laughs> 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 Sorry. Yeah. Did you actually compute uh, accuracy now? Uh, no, I just looked at it. <laughs> I'm a scientist. <laughs> no, so that's that's another thing. It's basically, basically trying to figure out when is it actually starting to overfit and you do losing this holdout set in a more quantitative way. Yes. Do you have a 3D to show like, rather than a slice? Um, so I, since I really implemented this today, I haven't like. Uh, implement saving the 3D volumes, um, uh, you know, in an NFT file or something like that. So I don't have that yet. So. Yes. What's your error metric? My my, my mod? <laughs> Your error metric. My error metric. Oh well, so there are two error metrics. So this is a generative uh, network. So. It, 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 it uses uh, two losses, and one of them is on like the reconstructed image, how similar it is to the original one, and the other one, whether the discriminator made an error or not. Uh, but you probably want more details? Yeah, that's good enough. That's good enough. Oh, yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and it was a. Uh, Interesting experience. I, I was be, be more fun with more people join, but I also I wasn't I was available all the time because I was trying to help people, and that was really fun. And it's always fun to work with Tal. And we, we had extra participants for a little bit, uh, but you know things happen. I hope everyone's happy. Cool. Visualization group. Make make it good. Utilization one of the issues with your software bag. <laughs> uh, no, this is the competitor. This is uh, exactly. Um, no, it's. Uh, let me just see if I can. Uh, do it. No. It's probably fine now. Oh yeah, Slack, Slack has a memory hog. No emails either. Hi everybody. Um, so we put together. Some tools for visualizing, in, um, like mostly 3D surfaces, uh, using Jupyter Notebook, which was largely an excuse to learn Jupyter Notebook. But uh, for instance, I learned that if you make this kind of annotation and then run it, it looks like that, which is prettier. <laughs> um, so uh, we're just going to kind of run through this notebook and hope everything doesn't crash. Uh, so here's many things that we're currently importing. This is probably overkill. Um, but Wanted to not crash. Uh, we start by just defining a bunch of data. Yeah, this is all pretty normal stuff, like pointing to paths. Um, yeah, one funny thing about loading uh, SIFTY data into um, uh, Python right now, at least using the like current version of uh, MyBabel, is you get this error message that I have been ignoring. That seems fun. Um, yeah, you want to? Uh, as a start, um, we wanted to just display services in Jupyter Notebook. I work a lot with FreeServer, so uh, it's really handy if I could actually look at the services and kind of 
you know, threshold them and do stuff with them in a notebook instead of saving it down and opening them in preview. So uh, we wrote a little function that does some checks and so on. And actually, uh, that function. function is on the yeah, <laughs> it's, it's on the on the visualization GitHub, so you can just download the .py, and I think it should run. So you should just be able to cache a function, import it, and when you actually you run it, need, then you may need to run this yeah. before you can. So what you get is actually, okay, now I hope I can run it Mac. You get a surface, you can interact with it like this if you actually have a mouse like me, you know, you're not used to Mac. The new Mac ones are really You can make it yeah. bigger. You have some options that you can uh, print one of the surfaces or you can print both of them. Um, oh, if you flip that over, uh, one of them, uh, the, the other one? Um, yeah. Uh, uh, one, one of them is actually, uh, Eli did that, uh, is thresholded with the medial wall is out. So you can also cut out stuff, basically make some annotations. That's shockingly difficult to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you have to actually uh, uh, cut kind of nodes out of the mesh in order to display it correctly and match it to the overlay. Um, the thresholding is not in the function yet, but the color mapping and other stuff is. So for now, ignore the medial wall, but that will be added soon. And well, then, we have function that does that, I think, in here. Yeah, so in this notebook should be there, the presentation notebook, and then... Um, so we then wanted to do some interactive uh, visualization um, with volumetric data. Uh, so we uh, used NI widgets functionality to um, get at this, and uh, Chris and Satra have been very helpful um, in, you know, how in determining how we should structure our class. We are still working on this. The update um, is a bit clunky, but it does what we want it to do. So you have these sliders that allow you to um, go through the image. If you click on the left side of the yeah. thing, it will open. And we are visualizing four, a 4D volume here, so uh, it's showing you the um, time uh, trend at our selected voxel, and the time point that we are looking at is highlighted in red, so we can scroll in time also, like this. Um, and we wanted to do this with um, surface data as well. Um, so we ended up writing a, a surface widget uh, class inside NI widget. So um, we are pretending that thickness and curve uh, files are, you know, different time points for this person uh, for for this demonstration here. So um, this is based off of the show surfaces function that Melanie was showing. So we can um, switch back and forth between time points, and we can change the color map and uh, play with this. Um, interactive 4D visualization on the surface. Uh, because this um, is based on IPy volume, it doesn't use matplotlib, it doesn't have the um, issues that the volumetric interactive visualization has. Um, okay. um, yeah, uh, I was uh, originally interested at my proposal been for like FSL maths for SIFTY, which I guess I'm like 4% of the way there, but I have a couple of functions that are useful. Um, one of them uh, is just reading in uh, the SIFTYs at all, which if you've ever dealt with them, they're like kind of monsters of amalgamated data. They're like a little hard to parse. Um, so there is, uh, thanks to Sasha now, a um, SIFTY2 function within uh, NiBabel. Uh, as of right now, I don't think it's in the like the release you would get if you were doing like Conda install, but you can get it off of GitHub and it'll be out like within a few days, I'm told. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Satra and Chris were super helpful with uh, getting all this stuff together. Um, so I guess for everybody, but uh, I feel good at it. So here I just read in a file, um, which uh, 
I can evidence that just by running this thing here, and I, I'm telling it to you know give me what are the dimensions of uh, the data, like SIFT data, and these match what I would expect, you know, 92, or yeah, 9100 or 91,000 uh, points and uh, 1,200 time points. Um, so that's uh, a necessary functionality. Uh, so is saving. Uh, so I'm just going to um, make a direct copy of this here. Um, so this is a function to save things up. Um, I don't currently have a, a running visualization for Sifty in um, in Jupyter Notebook. Uh, it's gonna, it's close. It's just like we basically have all the parts, but I haven't been quite finished it out. But I can demo this just in uh, Workbench View, which is the the other like team that's this is the uh, tool that's released by HCP. Um, so uh, the this is the original data here, and here's the demo I just saved, and they're the same, so that's good. Um, okay, but uh, more interestingly, we can also now threshold things, so you can set a lower threshold or an upper threshold. Um, so if I run these, um, and then plot a histogram, I guess it's already plotted, so I don't have to rerun it, but uh, yeah, um, this is. Um, before thresholding, and then after thresholding, uh, here's the one side, here's the other, so those two are related together, and yeah, they have the right shape and everything. Um, and also, I saved copies of those, um, so I can show a threshold image here. Um, and yeah, you can see this is like the peak areas here, so I, I set a lower threshold and excluded all the stuff that was like below. I don't know, I think 12,000 kind of early. And this is uh, th threshold in 4D um, adaptively, so every slice will have like different vertices that are under that, um, which is useful. Uh, and then uh, related functionality, you can just mask things, which uh, as far as I can tell is not a built-in function of a uh, connecting workbench. It still baffles me why, but. It's not that hard to actually get one out. So here's again the histogram of what it looks like. And then if you mask, um, just using a 3D uh, image, uh, you see there's kind of a tail here because um, things that are masked from like so the first volume, you know, there'll be some distribution out after that. So if you do a, uh, you get a cleaner break if you do a 4D mask, it's not necessary though. Um, and then I, just to kind of tinker with stuff, I took one of the uh, like upper threshold images and then masked it with a lower threshold, and so you get kind of intermediate ranges here. This is the histogram of values, and that's what this looks like. So it's missing the high values here, and also missing these low values here. Um, so those are those are things I wanted it to be able to do. Um, I, I'm still working on uh, like kind of breaking it out fully into. Uh, individual components that they can be plotted in that um, show surface function, but uh, no, I'll think about that. You know, but anyway, the visualizations seem to work pretty well. Uh, yeah. uh, that's everything. Do. And finally, team finance. That's loading. Probably just start us off. So <clears throat> we had a lot of projects that we were working on just kind of throughout the week. Um, and uh, some of the big ones, just as an overview, I think I'll just kind of talk about them and just let people who kind of were more involved in each of the projects talk about what they did. Um, but basically, so the summary is we are really just trying to get this pipeline to become something that's more usable and not just so experimental. And so part of that involved doing some big overhauls, including a lot of testing. Um, we're not done unit testing yet, but that's coming along. Um, adding support for Python 3. Um, we have, yes? Does that mean you can drop support for Python 2 now? 
uh, we in, we were going to do continuous support for both. Yeah, um, and some people are really stingy about their Python 2.7. I'm not sure why, but for those people, you can still use this workflow if you wish. Um, so it is available on PyPy, but it's in unofficial version, so I wouldn't trust it. I would trust the GitHub version. Um, in particular, if you want the latest, it's on the development branch. Um, so we've worked on a few things. Um, the One of the ones uh, that Josh and I worked on together was community detection. And do you want to maybe tell us what we did? Yeah, uh, well, we wanted to just visualize some communities. So we were using the uh, link clustering that's available in the, uh, well, it's available in BCT and it was ported over to BCTY. And so we thought we'd just get that up and running. It's a pretty uh, intensive uh, algorithm. And then what we uh, try to do as well uh, is get some cool viz going. So taking the output of that and putting it into a format that uh, could be made into a beautiful uh, widget looking thing. So that was that was uh, one of the nights. One of the nights, yeah. yeah. So I mean, these are just connectograms from Anisha's D3 setup, um, and we worked with uh, Anisha to get this going too. Um, but basically, what we kind of changed about the hierarchical bundling that's default with this kind of technique that's been made available is we kind of hacked it to be able to take clusters based on communities. And so that includes the link communities that we were working on, as well as uh, nodal communities, which you can see right back, um, right back in the this guy, which is just a nodal community. Um, so what's really exciting about this is um, we're hoping that it will be very interactive, which means that um, Basically, you can sort of click on a link. It's not going to work here, but um, you can click on a link. It'll show all of the other nodes that it's connected to. Um, and then the, the kind of long-term goal with this type of visualization is that we'd have kind of adjacent um, connectograms next to each other, one representing the structural equivalent. Um, and by that, I just mean through probabilistic tracking, we can, uh, PyNets can generate the equivalent to this based on any atlas. Um, and so the idea would be that you could essentially click on one of these links on your functional image and you could see its structural equivalent connections and the adjacent structural connectogram. So that's coming. Um, and let's go back to our list of things. So yeah, so um, another thing that this does is it, and for those of you who aren't familiar with PyNets, I should probably you know, just tell you what the, the aim is. The aim of this is to have a pipeline that is fully automated for Connectomics. So it's not meant to be user interactive. It's not meant to be some kind of tool for exploring connections, although this visualization component might be the exception to that. Um, it's meant to be able to, on the fly, use any atlas, um, any restricted network specification, um, for any subject, um, create a connectome. Um, and to do that without, basically from the command line or from within you know, your IPython session itself, um, to do that on the fly. And so part of that, um, because we're doing that on a single subject basis, complicates things, right? Because we have issues now with threshold error graphs. Um, so actually, this is a good probably time to jump into that in a second. But so yeah, so basically, we have um, multi-atlas iterables here, which means that the whole pipeline will run in parallel across you know six or seven atlases at the same time. Um, so you can get the equivalent connectome across array of atlases. You can even connect. You can even uh, you know, take your, your network metric outputs and aggregate them, or find the mean across all of the atlases. Um, you can also do the same thing across a range of thresholds um, that you specify. But the other thing we're working on with thresholding is really special, and I, I want James to talk about it because he's been working pretty hard at this, and it's a really exciting idea. Yeah, yeah. So one of the interesting things to look at with complex networks is uh, the presence of motifs in the network. Um, so if you just given some particular network, just draw something fake here uh, with several different nodes connected up. You might look for motifs of size four, which is just asking the question, how many times given a set of four motifs do you get this connectivity pattern versus how many times you get 
say, this connectivity pattern or this connectivity pattern or what have you. Um, each one of those, when you can rotate it, that would be the same motif. Uh, you have a set up for four nodes for these undirected graphs, uh, six different motifs you could possibly get. And you can count those in each of your networks. And that's interesting because it turns out in a lot of real world networks, uh, they have some motifs that are very much overrepresented, and you can tell something about the underlying graph structure from that. So that was something that I was interested in implementing in uh, this pipeline. And there were a lot of pre-existing Python packages that do a really good job of this, uh, but they're all kind of a pain uh, because they're all basically wrappers that I'm familiar with over um, C libraries, which are, um, you know, so I have spent a day getting graph tool going. So I wanted a, a pure Python implementation of this. I worked on it and have one that works reasonably well. Uh, and Derek was mentioning uh, doing this simultaneously for both structural and functional connectomes. Uh, for the structural ones, uh, going from just a weighted uh, connection graph to just a binary, is it connected, is it not, a particular set of nodes is pretty easy. But for a functional one, you have a continuous range of weights and it's unclear how to do the threshold. Uh, so we were thinking one of the things you can potentially compare between the structural and functional graph would be uh, the motif counts, uh, the distribution of motifs at various thresholds for the functional graph versus the structural graph. Uh, and uh, Derek found a paper that suggests that this might be biologically plausible, so all the better. Um, yeah, yeah, I can you know pick up there. So basically, you know this this is ultimately leading to um, an algorithm that we kind of dub adaptive thresholding. And what it does is it, it applies an absolute threshold to your graph iteratively by a step that you can specify. But ultimately, you'd want it to be as kind of infinitesimally small as possible. Um, and as it continues to threshold the graph, um, it counts the motifs each time between your functional graph that you're thresholding and your structural graph based on the probabilistic tracking. And it, the point at which the number of motifs equals the number uh, in the functional uh, graph that's being thresholded it equals the number of motifs in your structural graph is a, actually, we're thinking it's a, a point of stability. Biologically, that although there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between fun fun function and structure, um, as we all know, um, there is good evidence to think that there's a good correspondence between motifs and uh, these sort of, these triangular uh, connections. And if you go to that figure that we have, um, this is basically showing exactly that. Here is the distribution of those motifs. Each column is a uh, count of a different motif for the structural connect, uh, connect dome and, and then for the functional threshold at various points. And if you look at the uh, sum of the absolute difference between this and this for the different thresholds, you get, um, that's what's plotted on the horizontal axis here, and it has a local minimum at some point. Uh, so this perhaps is an optimal threshold for the, uh, where the motif structure is most similar between your functional and your structural graph. And at that point, if you threshold it to that particular point, and you do this across subjects, you would need both a structural and a functional image to go in here. Then theoretically, it would facilitate group analysis in a, re in a reliable way without the need for, uh, for doing it across a range of thresholds and for doing it without a group sparse uh, connectome or some kind of group connectome that you're analyzing with to do prediction. And this is really exciting because it means that you know, if this is right, we could do this on the fly on a single subject basis and estimate connectomes that are, that are reliable on a single subject basis and it could facilitate all kinds of new uh, approaches for analysis, um, so. And this is fully automated with it's the fully plans. automated. So basically you just feed it your bedpost X directory, you feed it a functional image in normal, or in uh, MNI space. And theoretically we could do this soon. So uh, that's, that's one of uh, several things that we accomplished this week, but that one I think is really special and really exciting. So I wanted, you know, James to be able to talk about it. Um, and uh, let's see.
know there was others. Um, we're running out, I know we're running out of time, but I just wanted to quickly mention the one that I did this morning and then bask. Um, so Josh and I this morning managed to hack the, uh, we managed to hack the new Yeo Atlas uh, 2017, Yeo Schaefer Atlas, um, so that basically on the fly, you can also um, feed any atlas to this pipeline. It could be a nifty image from, you know, uh, for example, we've been playing with Tal's uh, experimental atlas from Neurosynth. Um, you could feed it that, and it will, based on a 1,000 parcel resting state network um, uh, definition, it will generate the 17 U networks um, for you um, based on whatever atlas you give it, um, which, which is for any subject automatically, um, which is a really cool thing. And you know, we busted our asses trying to get it to work, but it's it's pretty cool. The last big surprise was Basque. So. Mm, yeah. So uh, I mentioned at the beginning, yeah, Basque is a technique that you can get like. You can use your data to create a parcellation instead of just like inheriting a parcellation that someone else has done on some other set of data. Um, and so, yeah, BASC, uh, BASC has been implemented now in PyNets. Uh, so you can, um, if you have PyNets and you have BASC, um, there's just a simple flag. You just say dash BASC, and it'll run BASC first, and then create all of your uh, create all of your parcellations for your data, and then it'll feed all of that through to uh, PyNets. So uh, one feature that BASC has is that it enables you to um, ask more detailed questions about the connectome. So, um, my, for example, my big one of my big research interests is in the relationship between the basal ganglia and cortex. And so, in order to study cortical uh, uh, cortical uh, striatal loops, uh, I can, for example, say I want to uh, parcel the basal ganglia according to its connectivity to the motor network or partial basal ganglia according to its connectivity to cerebellum, et cetera. And so you can get different sorts of um, parcellations of different brain regions depending on their connectivity to a, another brain region. And then um, if, you, you know, auto, if you're using PyNets, that'll basically give you uh, an automated uh, set of graph metrics that describe uh, the different networks that you're looking at in detail. So yeah, we've uh, definitely um, had some really interesting, uh, uh, I don't know, accomplishments um, and some exciting things have happened uh, throughout uh, the work this week and we're really grateful for the time that we could spend working on these cool projects and I know everyone was like pretty pumped and, and uh, Grace revamped our, uh, our documentation and really looked through a lot of the node statistics, a lot of the net statistics, as did James. So we're we're really hoping this becomes something that you know can can spread a little bit more and be a little less experimental and more usable. Yeah. Wow, that was uh, that was pretty great. Um, and those, those were all the presentations. Um, so we do have some time now, and uh, before we need to head out, um, it's, yeah, so like I said, uh, uh, I'll be at Lander at 5.30 to walk over from the front desk to the bus. If you want to make your way before that, feel free to head over. Um, there's like a park in South Lake Union that's pretty nice. You can walk around, go take a look at the Alma Institute, which is right there. It's like walk down this new walking distance right there, where the, the cruise heads out. But please be at six uh, at REC. Yes, Chris. Uh, well, I, I feel like I wanted to say there was like one other project that nobody really talked about because it was kind of like a meta project around this thing, which was setting up that damn Jupiter hub and getting it to actually work. And the Ariel put in a ton of time. Our hub team that uh, worked with me uh, through several <laughs> nights and mornings and days and various hours and Sasha was set that up as well. That was a fun, interesting hack. Uh, most of it was done last week, not uh, this week, but it was an interesting uh, technical hack. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll make a few more words of thanks on, on the boat as we're there. Thank uh, people who helped put this together. But um, for now, like I said, uh, uh, you can hang out here or you can head over to South Lake Union and I'll head over to South Lake Union around uh, 5.30 or at 5.30 from Lander front desk. Uh, you can all find your ways in various ways. Be at 6 at Argosy at the AGC Marina. Uh, does, 
Does everybody know how they're getting there? If you don't know how you're getting there, come to me and ask me how to get there. Uh, we set sail at 6.30, and we come back at 9.30, just so you know. It's a 6.30 to 9.30. Um, yeah. <laughs> how, right. it, how cold is it supposed to be at night? Uh, is it like colder out of the boat? Like, the... Uh, so I would take another way there. Yeah. It, might, it, it may or may not. It doesn't really usually get that cold. Uh, the temperature difference between night and day is not huge in Seattle. Um, so don't worry about it too much. We'll take another layer with you. Uh, it's, yeah, the temperatures have been dropping all day, so they might drop further.